Um, for those who, you who have been here before, you're probably wondering why we're not in the chamber, but we thought you could snack and nibble during this event. Um, if you have not been here before, please do stop in and take a peek at our fabulous replica chamber and sit down in one of those senator's seats and imagine what you would do if you were a senator today. Um, imagining the possibilities is what we're going to talk about tonight. We know what our good Senator Kennedy would be doing if he was in the Senate today. He would certainly be an advocate for the National Endowment and for the arts as he was across his entire career. Um, he'd be thrilled that we're hosting this event here this evening and having a conversation about arts power to invigorate civil discourse and how civil engagement and advocacy often happens when it's enhanced through the creative expression of the arts. Recent events, the tragedy of the today shooting, show us more than ever that we need an avenue for constructive conversations around the very complicated issues that are affecting our nation's policies and our everyday lives. Art, imagination, envisioning possibilities can be an alternative expression to violence, terror, and the lack of hope that they represent. Um, when Senator Kennedy began to formulate a vision for our institute, he was clear that it should be about the Senate but not solely about the Senate. He wanted the Institute to be a center of civic engagement for a community in Boston that has seen breathtaking transformations over 50 years. He wanted to, to be a place where ideas could come to life, where there could be dialogue, and where a, it would be a place where students, educators, leaders, historians, and artists could gather and be inspired and inspire each other. Um, this evening's discussion certainly fits into that vision. Um, tonight's panelists are all actively exploring the powerful cross-section of arts and civic engagement and working to promote creative expression as a way to bring unheard voices to life. Um, Jason Talbot, through his role as co-founder and special projects director for Artists for Humanity, works to address society's most challenging social, economical, and racial issues by securing paid employment in art and design for Boston's youth. The Institute is proud to have commissioned two collaborative works, art murals, one which you can see right over here, and another one which is in our room around the corner if you want to go exploring, uh, from these talented artists, one of which is hanging, as I said, behind you. Karen Gross is a senior counsel of Finn Partners and uh, a reformed college president like myself, the author of a new book called Teach Our Children Well. She spent her career as an educator and author discussing the importance of civic education and activism through art. Tony King, headmaster of Boston International Newcomers Academy, has spent the last five years helping to close opportunity gaps for adolescent English language learners. We are honored his student's mural from her beacon is currently on display on, on this wall right here. Um, Julie Burroughs, Chief of Arts and Culture for the City of Boston, is dedicated to growing the thriving cultural community in Boston and pro promoting participation in the arts. She leads the efforts of Boston Creates, the Cultural Plan for Boston, the Boston Cultural Council, and the Boston Arts Commission. She's a busy lady, as you can see. Thank you all for joining us tonight. So now let me introduce and hand the conversation over to our moderator for this evening's program, Jared Bowen. Jared is WGB8's Executive Arts Editor and the host of Open Studio. Jared, we couldn't think of a better person to lead tonight's discussion. 
So if all of you want to join us on the platform here. Well, thank you all for coming. It's great to be surrounded by art as we have this conversation, as Dr. McCormick said. Uh, I want to start this conversation, we'll get right into it, and I, I, I want to ask about the events of, of this week, not even today, but there's so much happening in the world that it does arise on a daily basis now, but we saw in New York the public theater was going to, is presenting Julius Caesar uh, as their Shakespeare in the Park programming this year, and there's a, a huge controversy about this play because the the artistic vision of this has Julius Caesar portrayed as somebody who looks an awful lot like the president. And of course, in this play, Julius Caesar is assassinated, and there's been a lot of conversation about whether that's appropriate to do this. So it's suddenly, we, we're, we seem to be having, at least I'm noticing, more and more conversations around the appropriateness of art and what liberties are allowed. And I have begun to wonder, at what point does this begin to stifle artistic vision? And especially as our focus here tonight is talking about children. So I'm wondering from you what landscape we see right now and what this means for the immediate future when we're having these conversations. So Julie, I'll start with you. And I'll mention that Julie is not listed in your program because she thought this was important enough to change her schedule to be here with us today, uh, so, which is fantastic. But Julie, let me ask you where Thanks. you think that stands. So I think that it's incredibly exciting that a 400-year-old or so play being produced today is um, provoking so many questions and so much discussion. I think that really speaks to the power of um, great artworks to have enduring relevance and um, the ability to be made relevant again and again with interpretation. Um, so just the fact that that's happening actually makes me very happy that it provokes discussion because I think that very broadly speaking, this is often the role of artists. Ask questions, probe the current conditions, um, search for answers turn things around and examine them in new lights. So I, I think the artists are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing and um, provoking discussion and exploration and understanding um, through that um, artistic journey. At, from my perspective, that's, that's really the role of the artist and the role of the arts. Well, Jason, and we'll turn this into a conversation, but just to get it started, maybe I'll do some directed questions. But Jason, the second layer to this is that two corporations, Bank of America, Delta Airlines, have pulled out their funding. So do your kids see a situation where suddenly, or do they feel a climate suddenly where it's okay to make certain art, but it's not okay to make other depictions? Well, I think that's, it's a, it's a very delicate dance that we do as artists. It's our job to provoke. It's our job to have in-depth discussion and through our art and send messages that are important to us and our communities. It's, it's, it's very difficult to make sure that you're putting out the right messages at the right times. Now, I personally feel it is a little, a little uh, risque to threaten the life of our president of the United States of America, but I do remember a time when the Tea Partiers showed up at b parades at Barack Obama's inauguration with guns on their hips. And that was a much more real threat, of an actual threat of violence. So where we can't use our imaginations and our uh, acting and theatrical plays to, to have a discussion to have a dialogue around these issues, I think is a little ridiculous compared to you know, the rest of our country and the way that we uh, exercise our rights. Karen, I know that you have been paying attention to the events of today, meaning the shooting in Virginia uh, of the congressman and the security detail. Uh, and you have looked at how, what that means in terms of, of, of arts and that people often find solace in the arts after a, a trauma like that. Uh, where do you see the place of arts right now in this climate? Um, so I, I think I can also speak to the Julius Caesar piece as part of this. I, I, as an educator, 
I think art is one way that students can speak up and out. And I think it's also one way that they can express what often is censored in other environments. And so one thing for me as, you, as one thinks about today's events is that it creates a lot of anxiety in kids and in adults. And the question is where do you put that anxiety and how can you express it? And the arts are one way to do that. And protest art in all of its forms, plays, music, um, drama, opera, real visual art, all have a history of protest. And in fact, Carolyn Kennedy wrote a book called A Patriot's Handbook, mm. in which she talks about dissenters' art as being part of what it means to be a patriot. So you can dissent in this country and do protest art and still be viewed as central to who we are as a nation. So, How do you define protest art? So the Julius Caesar play, as crafted now, would be protest art. Um, I don't think the piece on the wall down there, the one on immigration that people color in, is protest art. Um, but a lot of the art that's in my new book, which is signs from the post-inaugural march on January 21st, is most assuredly protest art. Um, remarkable protest art. And, and the Amplify Foundation, which did some of the march's protest art, is stunning in its power. And so when you see it, you realize the opportunity that it gives you to get voice. And actually outside my office when I was a college president and now in my home is a piece of art that says speak. That's protest art for me too. And Tony, we've referenced your piece a couple, uh, or your student's piece. I, I wish it was my piece. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me how, that was, how, how this was born. Well, sure. I think the conversation about expression in silence, especially in this in this context, is is really important. Uh, so the school where I work is a 100% immigrant high school with a large number of refugee students. And the day after the election was the first day we've ever had in our school that it was quiet in the hallways. We're very proud of our very loud hallways, but not that day. It was uh, eerily silent. The students were there, but struggling to process. Having an amazing team of teachers, the teachers had been up since the crack of dawn. Some hadn't slept. They were not in great shape themselves, but knew immediately that they needed to help kids process. And as I went from classroom to classroom, it was amazing to see how many of the teachers had opted for art to be that way that the kids processed. And it wasn't this art. Some of it was very primitive art about fears. Kids were drawing pictures of things that they were afraid of. There were a lot of airplanes being drawn, kids wondering if they, if they were welcome. But that opportunity to express was really important to, to that moment. And as a school community, as we processed the next few steps, we have integrated art into each piece of that, sort of with the, the big piece being on Diversity and Democracy Day, which is what we called Inauguration Day at our school. We didn't have school that day. We did 50 workshops with community members and teachers and all of our students. And one of the options for students to choose was to create art and uh, a team of teachers and students created the, the murals that, that surround us. And it was one more opportunity for the kids to have voice and connect and be able to uh, express in this, in this complicated time. Well, let's open it up and have more discussion now. So I'll just toss out, what does art do that other things can't, that protests can't, that speeches can't, uh, that, that having conversation can't. What does it allow people? Yeah, I, I wanted, I'll jump in um, and talk about 
uh, we did this cultural plan called Boston Creates. And the name Boston Creates really embraces the fact that most people have the urge to engage in some kind of creative expression. Um, and you don't have to be good at it to benefit from doing it. We all know this, <laughs> um, right? Uh, and there are um, so many benefits from getting into a flow state. You know, the physicians who play in the Longwood Symphony do it because playing music helps engage their brain in different ways and it actually helps them process the difficulty of being a physician and being the healer. Um, so we hear all the time that music is very healing. Um, so I think that there's a certain kind of a, um, a healing aspect to engaging in all kinds of creative expression. Um, but there's also just the literal fact of finding your voice. You know, you see teenagers um, at louder than a bomb, literally finding their voice and expressing what's inside and churning around and coming out and speaking it so strongly in words, it's so empowering. Um, so there's so many, many benefits to engaging in creative expression. And um, you know what we're dedicated to doing is really helping have broad, equitable access to this so that everyone can gain from the benefits of creative expression, whether you're doing it just avocationally or at a, a really high professional level. So the, the, the way you're describing art is as a singular activity that someone does. I think there's a value to collaborative art. And out of, there's certainly value to a single person doing art. But collaborative art has enormous power not only in terms of the individual and what he or she gets out of it, but what happens when a collective group of people create art that they can then go back and look at. So participatory art, engaged art, the kind of art that's on the wall there where people can color together, or this that was made by multiple kids. And the literature, not to sound like an academic that I am, but the data support that collaborative art enables kids to do better in school, to be more civically engaged, and to develop a better sense of self. So it isn't just that it feels good, but they actually can demonstrate a set of skills that they acquire through it. So I think that's one of its powers, I totally agree. collaboration. I love uh, art's power to condense and capture complex ideas, history, culture. They can all sit and reside in one image. You know, we all remember this, this picture of Obama optimistically looking into the future with hope. Did, would he have gotten elected without that Shepard Ferry poster? Probably. Would Hillary have gotten elected if she had one? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it, it, to be able to distill that person and that campaign into that image is something that burns into your mind, is easily, easily communicated, and it's, and it's one of those things that really just encapsulates a, a huge world in just one image. It can really transport people to another place. To connect to the, the individual and the collective, I, I see both, mm -hmm. and I see both in, in our school. We have students who are individuals who, who will say to me that they, they'll put up with the rest of their classes because they have art. Mm -hmm. And that's a really powerful statement for, for kids in a really complex world trying to negotiate why this, this school is meaningful to them in many of their classes. But to have one class that is optimally meaningful to them, and maybe it's a place where they're connecting to others who share that, that particular passion is a, is, a, is a powerful thing to have uh, young people experience. But it can be all kinds of art. It can be music, it can be visual arts, it can be drama. I mean, it, it's a remarkable way for kids and young adults, and actually grown adults, to um, express themselves individually and collectively um, in the same space. 
So we're, we're talking, we're extolling the benefits of art. We're all people who profoundly are, I, I think I can argue for the entire panel, who've been affected by art and who passionately seek it out. But let me take the floor away for a moment because we also see a lot of studies where, in a lot of school districts where the arts aren't a huge component, where the money is, that's, that's the last place that the money is allocated, where uh, you have a whole sector of adults who are still intimidated to go into museums, to go to a performance, and of course that filters down to their kids. So is there a climate right now that allows for anyone who wants to make art to feel like they belong? Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, well, you asked like a really complicated question. But, but I will say that um, empowering people to you know, uh, learn or be open-minded, I mean, all the time people tell me, well, I, um, I, I'm afraid of jazz or I'm afraid of opera. Fill in the blank. People are afraid of poetry. They're afraid, you know, they're like, oh, I heard about this really cool thing in Central Park with the orange fabric and it sounded neat and I thought I should take my kids, but I was kind of afraid I wouldn't get it. And, you know, yeah, as Chief of Arts and Culture, I hear from everyone about there is that intimidation factor, um, which is so unfortunate. And I, and I, I am uh, a champion for people just, you know, open your heart and the art will do the work, right? It's a great art. It doesn't, it, it, whatever level you might understand it on, it's, it, it, it will do its work if it's good. Um, so, so there are a lot of fears to overcome. I think your TV show probably does a lot to help make um, things much more welcoming. But we know that the cultural sector has a language problem, has an issue problem. There's so many barriers to participate. And, and large institutions aren't really great at knowing how to make themselves feel really welcome to everyone. So, so I think there's a movement away from art being only for the elite. And if you think about going to Philharmonic or symphony and everybody's all dressed up and quiet, and actually the only people in there, people that many people would call sort of like um, Q-tips, right? Old and white hair. And I, I think there has to be an effort to change that or the next generation will not be participating effectively in the arts. And at the college, I, I, we had a chamber orchestra in residence. And I noticed that the only people who went were sort of 70 and up. I mean, none of our students ever went. And our students, many of whom were first generation or Pell eligible, would not have walked into a museum. They weren't used to walking in. So unless we change the elite nature of art, and people who now do street art are, I think, the start of making a change that art can be accessible to many. And so we can be as critical as we want of Banksy and others, but they are making art that people can access. So you don't need to have a Cezanne hanging in your dining room to be able to appreciate art. I mean, go draw, go color, or chalk on the sidewalk. And uh, there's also, that is almost ground level of how you rob a people of their voice and their humanity. Take their art. Don't allow them to have culture. Don't allow them, don't fund their schools. Don't lock the doors, you know, make this, prohibit people uh, from access to art is one way to, to, to steal their culture and, and, and allow other people to victimize them. If you're, if you're a megalomaniac and you've got some secret master plan to enrich you and all your rich buddies, maybe you don't want artists pulling back the veil and showing everybody your secrets and your plans. Maybe you don't want a critical voice that, can, that is free and, and uninhibited and fearless out there putting their work uh, on walls for everyone to see. It's, it's much better to, it's much uh, more advantageous to silence those voices while they're young, to, to make them fear the art that can empower them so that our young people and our future artists are obedient to you know, the powers that be. Well, Jason, so, let me just ask you to follow up on that point. Artists for Humanity is an organization that gives kids that empowerment, that gives kids that voice, and a constituency that, that might go ignored because they don't have as much opportunity as a lot of other kids in the, across the state might. So what is the entry point for those kids? How do you get them? How do you plant that kernel so they realize that they can have everything that you just described? Well, this is, this is the idea. You see, young people, you know, 
they think outside the box because they're not in the box yet. They're not bought in. They're not, they're not saddled with student debt. They don't have a boss who's going to fire them if they're too outspoken. They are outspoken. They have the freedom to say what's on their mind. They have the intelligence to be critical of the world around them. And so for us, it's important to get that voice out there. It's important for us to make sure that young people are heard because they are, are absorbing and, and, and thinking about and regurgitating the, the most new cutting edge discoveries and understandings about humans, emo, uh, their emotional state and our world. And the more that we can tap into them, I think the more uh, we'll be enriched to society, but it does leave behind some of the old structures, some of the older uh, uh, ways of, of, of governing and uh, of manufacturing and so on. And so uh, it's a little difficult for people to, to let go and allow that next generation to speak up. I, so I, here's think about, I think about Artists for Humanity as a powerful organization working with a, a relatively large group of students in, in, in Boston. But when I think about scale, in, in Boston, scale is going to happen in the Boston public schools, largely. Um, I know Laura from Edvesters is back here too, who invests a lot in, in the arts. And it's the schools that up till now, even with changes in investments, still don't have the kind of investment that's going to give enough kids that first opportunity, that first window. Yes, a lot of kids are, you know, they'll take out the chalk and on the sidewalk, but a lot of the kids at my school and other schools, they're, they're not living in communities where the kids are doing that kind of thing. So the artistic expression really starts in the schools which are dramatically underfunded. When I, I'm, this is only my second year as principal, the first position I was able to create was a .6 visual arts teacher in my school because I knew it was going to have an impact on how the school what felt. Is, so can I? What is point can, six? I just, oh, point six is a little over half time. And now that teacher is going to be full time. And we have a, a lot of students who were reluctant to be there initially, who had never been had any type of formal arts experience, including dance or or anything, and who now feel really excited when they when they walk into school to have that opportunity. So I think just the schools are a really important part. So cutting the arts is obviously unwise on any number of levels, but sort of like saying if you're dissatisfied with the way government is running now, it's mobilized democracy and activism among a number of people who haven't heretofore been activated. One thing that cutting art as a separate siloed subject may do is allow art to be integrated into other disciplines. And in fact, there's something to be said for art being integrated across the disciplines. And so to the extent that cuts are horrible, an upside would be to find a way to introduce art in math and art in science and art in literature courses so that actually you don't lose it. You find a way to do math that has drawing and you find a way to do STEM disciplines that has art or drama or something. So it's bad, but in a time of cuts, you have to think about other ways to get to the same creativity in the absence of the funding to do it the right way. It's so funny that you're mentioning this because this is the third time this week I've had this conversation, which I hope that means that there's some sort of groundswell about this, this element of integration in the classroom. But can you just tell us, for people who may not understand why it's so important to have an arts, pro, an arts teacher, an arts co-teacher in a math class or a science class or, or literature, just anecdotally, what the difference is? Well, art is a great can be as great as a metaphor for understanding, right? Um, so arts integration um, and fine arts classes in school and out of school is the ideal. Let's be honest, you know, if you don't have it in school, there might be opportunities at home or out of school. But arts integration is um, how you explained sound waves through music. 
um, and how you can um, really help people to understand really complex concepts through this sort of complex um, uh, communications, right? You know, inertia and movement and physics can actually be well explained with dance and movement. Um, it's really creative, it's really engaging, amazing metaphors, and sometimes so much more memorable and understandable um, than just uh, reading it in a textbook or having someone sort of spit out a lesson to you. So it's dynamic, it's engaging, it, it engages you on many different levels. I'm not the educator, so that's just my own personal understanding. So, so, from, so I from would tell you that, that we in education sadly silo subjects as if somehow they don't in real life intersect. Um, and we do this throughout the educational pipeline, and we don't have a lot of interdisciplinary classes or interdisciplinary teaching. So we teach English over here, and we teach Spanish over here, and we teach science over here. And by the way, in graduate school, we don't do it any differently than that. You teach contract law over here and con law over here. And the, I, I used to keep saying, you know, it's not as if clients come into a lawyer with a sign that says, I'm a con law problem or I'm a civil liberties problem. They come in with a problem. And if we don't start doing better at breaking down silos in education, we won't be providing quality education. Real life is multidisciplinary. But I, we don't teach that way. I agree so much. Like right now at Artists for Humanity, we are definitely have a focus on the STEM education as it relates to art. And uh, you know, we call it rather than STEM, it's STEAM, science, right, technology, STEAM. engineering, yes. arts, and math. But personally, I found that it takes STEM to make art. And you know, the science is, is just, that's just observation, you know, just understanding the world that you're looking at, looking at what happens and why, the technology, you know, we've got computers, we've got cameras, we've got, uh, you know, lasers, uh, the list. And then, of course, with engineering, we have to build all these ideas that we have, all these, um, all these amazing products that we produce. And the mathematics, that's the, that's the quantum, that's quantifying it all, you know, the time it took, the, the dollars spent, the, the, uh, the, the size, the location, it all, it all comes together. And, yeah, I think it is. It's, it's, when you, when you break everything apart so that you can have an expert in each subject, yes, it makes sense in school, but in real life, yeah, you gotta draw it all together. Jason, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit because it just to start, when we started off talking about Julius Caesar and you thought the depiction was a bit risque, which made me wonder, we want to encourage kids, you want to introduce them to the arts, you want them to push forward and, and presumably break boundaries so that they can communicate their, their existence and their surroundings. Uh, but we also just saw what happened to Kathy Griffin, speaking of the president and his likeness. Kathy Griffin is an artist of a sort, and there was a huge backlash against her, and then, I don't know what the opposite of a backlash is, a frontlash, where people came back and supported her and said, no, she has her voice. But are there limits that you all see? Can you cross the line? Yeah, I, that, that, that to me, cross the line. I have to say, I mean, I'm no fan of Trump, but... I don't want to see our president assassinated, and, and not even as a joke. And I was outraged when, it, when, when these guys were, were exercising their Second, second Amendment rights at, 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 the, at a, a Barack's, uh, Barack Obama's uh, inauguration. It outraged me then. And so I, I'm not a tit-for-tat type of person. It was wrong then, it's wrong now. Mm -hmm. you know? And then uh, and with that, you know, but you know, those people with their guns, they were exercising their Second Amendment rights. We also have First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. So if she wants to post that picture, if Kathy Griffin wants a, a beheaded Trump, then that's her decision as, a, as an American. She can say it, and we can have a problem with it, and that's art at its best. Mm -hmm. I want to have a problem with, uh, with art that I disagree with. I want to be outraged. I want people who disagree with my art to be outraged. Mm -hmm. If someone sees, you know, the depiction of, of, of Im immigrants on this piece we have here and is outraged by the brown faces on that, on that canvas, thank you. I am very happy at how upset you are at how diverse our country is. Mm -hmm. That's the way it should be. See, I think you start to play it safe with art. You lose one of its core values, which is to make you think and to make you pause where you didn't pause before. And we may not like it 
a lot of the time or it may not meet our own sensibilities, but to not enable it to happen is to destroy the very purpose of art. And so if you, if you think for a moment, and it wasn't an art event, of when Colin Kaepernick, the quarterback, refused to stand for the national anthem and people got all upset. One group of people actually didn't get upset and that was the military mm -hmm. who said, we go out and fight every day for your right not to stand. Mm -hmm. And that's true for art as well. We fight for the right to be able to make whatever kind of art you wanna make. I mean, Brecht was right. He said, art's a hammer. Yeah, and I will say that, you know, yesterday's outrage is tomorrow's all the rage, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and it's just so true. Um, and, and people can, can choose to not go. You know, the people who are outraged by the, this interpretation of Julius Caesar, don't go. You know, I'm sure it's the hottest ticket in New York right now. Um, and if you think about there was an outrage or a controversy about Hamilton casting a black man to play um, George Washington. I don't know who's seen Hamilton here, right? And it is, it, you know, there was controversy and oh, the casting, they, did, they wanted to hire only cast of color. And people were like, oh, well, what about, well, you know, what about the, all those plays that were cast and all the musicals that had all white casts? You didn't even, you didn't complain about that. You know, it, it, I'm telling you, it's just, do you look through the, the history of, of outrage about arts and culture and, and all these things and, um, you know, if you're, if you're upset, stay at home. Don't watch the show, don't go. Sometimes there are things that cross the lines for some people. I was just at an art exhibition and there was a, a whole exhibit about Annie Sprinkle, who in the 70s did this extremely daring sort of feminist body performance art that was extremely outrageous for the time in the 70s, it today would still be considered extremely on the fringe, extremely outrageous, and it is not everybody's cup of tea. Um, but, but for some people, it is a revolution and a door into unbelievably new ideas and new ways of th seeing the world. And I, I think the idea of comfort and being uncomfortable is, is perfectly fine. And we, we put our students in situations where we want them to be uncomfortable and feel that. And it can be art that produces that, that feeling. And our students can produce things that surprise us and might make us feel uncomfortable. But I, I think in a lot of ways, so many people are too comfortable all the time that the, the idea of creating a sense of discomfort is, is a good thing. Okay, well, at this point, we'll turn it over to the audience questions, and there'll be uh, mics flanking both sides of the audience. Who's going to be the brave soul to ask the first question? I love a brave soul right in the back. Coming for you. Oh, um, so you guys have talked a lot about um, art as a medium for expression and for the artists themselves and like what it does for the person who creates the art. But I'm also curious to hear your opinions about the power art can have on the audience rather than just the artist because I think if we get caught up in the power the art has on the artist, then we're in a really self-indulgent like environment. So what's, what does it do for the audience? Oh yeah, and we could all probably talk for hours about this. But I, I will I will say that I saw the um, movie Life Animated. It was the Oscar winning documentary about a young man who with autism who is essentially unlocked by Disney movies and it's um was written by a book written by his dad and the movie it was amazing and and I sat next to an autistic boy during the play and I, nobody who sees that movie isn't utterly transformed um, and opened up and their mind opened in so many ways. So the, the power of storytelling to transform people's lives, to transmit information, to build empathy, to help you understand um, so much about the world. I mean, I, I'm the world's, I am Boston's most ardent um, audience member of the arts and, and, and yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 
Uh, there was a mural when I was growing up. It was by Dana Chandler, and it was about uh, staying in school, but there wasn't anything about school in it, really. There was Malcolm Max and, and, and Martin Luther King and, and flame and, and three and four eyes on people's faces, and I just remember you know, I, I never stood face to face with this piece. I could only see it for a split second going in and out of the bus station. But it blew my mind every day I saw it. It made me want to put paint on walls. I feel like it educated every kid. It gave a piece of beautiful art to the whole entire community of, 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 of Roxbury. And, you know, it changed my mind. It changed my life. And it stuck, on, it stuck in my mind, and it helped me understand imagery. It brightened my life. And I just, I, I am indebted to Dana Chandler. I am indebted to this man and his mural. And I feel like all the art that we, that we, we should work to inspire so greatly to force people into action, to help them better understand our world and each other and our community. And, our, has that ability and, and we can exercise it. So it's, 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 it's not about the people making the art, it's about the art that represents our world in, in a way that can be transformative. So I, I think you're asking a really good question about what an artist also hopes to accomplish with his or her art. And while there are some artists who would like to keep their art private, most artists actually want communities to partake of their art. Um, so I, I think you raise a really important issue. I, I would, there's, a, there's a book by a guy named Tony Hiss um, about, called The Experience of Place, in which he talks about what's on the walls and in the halls matter, because people get a sense of their environment based on what they see day in and day out. So, for example, don't paint a hospital room green. You will feel really sick if you weren't already. Well, you were already because you were there. But so they figured out that what you see makes a difference. So does art for people with Alzheimer's. So does art that hangs in schools. So there's many ways that art informs space and place. And I'd ask this question, why aren't more corporations and schools putting art up on their walls and in their halls, even controversial art? So most places have stairwells that you walk up and down. You don't see art in those stairwells. And when I actually suggested it at the school, people thought, like, are you nuts? I'm going, well, actually, people walk up and down the stairs. Why not put art there for them to see and experience? And if they pause, all the better. So my experience is they pause uh, at our school when there's art on the walls. And many of the audience members themselves then start asking questions about what, the, what, they, what they see. And I spend a lot of time in the hallway. So I get asked a lot of questions, which make me think a lot about the, the art that our students have produced that's up, that's up on the walls. So I think there's a powerful impact on the audience. And a certain subset of the audience find themselves wanting to say something themselves through art, which I think is maybe one of the more powerful impacts. Other questions? Right here in the second row. While they're bringing the microphone, I'll just break the wall and say that I don't have an arts background, and I've become one of the more visible f people representing the arts in this whole region, but the, I just found the arts. They, they, they came to me, and a lot of my coverage is driven by emotion and curiosity uh, and an appreciation that, that bounds after these years, but I, I think it's important to say that I'm not probably the I don't have that lofty arts background that people would assume that, that I might have. Uh, it's, it's so important. I didn't see my first major show until I think I was just about to graduate high school. It came to me late, but I think that's the power of the arts. It's out there in the ether, and then it grabs you, and it grabs the people it's supposed to, to, to help them in whatever moment of life uh, they need. So this is a little difficult question. Um, um, the um, Boston Cultural Council, um, amazing 
beautiful vision, but what do you do in the community outside of the art community isn't buying into it. Um, it's extremely challenging to be in the neighborhoods and to get support from anybody you would ask support from that you would think would give you support and not just support, not money, not we can get money, we can get space, we can get time, but we can't get that person to make that phone call or return that email. Can I have a wall, no a wall for some young people to put a piece of art on? No reply, no reply. Can my kids put some ornaments on that tree? No, we own that tree, that's our tree. You can't put your ornaments on this tree. I've had these experiences. And um, I'm absolutely floored by the punitive and dismissive attitudes that people who are accepting money from the city of Boston give to people that the city of Boston has given money to. And it's not about the money, it's about where is our vision and who is following our vision and where is the, where is the follow through. Because um, I feel very strongly about the arts. I'm a native Bostonian, I'm an urban, I was, I was in the urban environment, grew up in Dorchester, no art classes, right? <laughs> I have a BFA, but I did it in New York. Mm. And I asked a local person for a wall and did he know what wheat paste was? And he told me no, he did not know what that was. He had never been to Brooklyn. He, so it is a difficult thing, and I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just saying, how do we diffuse the resistance? How do we have them buy into the rest of it? Not the funding, the funding is there. Not the children, the children are there. How do we get the community to help move this forward? These Thank you young for the question. Let's, yeah. let's. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry that you've had a negative experience, perhaps with my office. Um, no, okay, I, I'm not 100% clear on your question, but I will say that what I'm hearing is that, uh, and what we heard from artists in Boston is that they don't feel that they have agency. Okay, good, I'm glad I got that. Um, I heard that right. Right, and so, you know, part of why I came to Boston two and a half years ago and I accepted this job, this newly created job to be Chief of Arts and Culture and head up the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture is that Mayor Walsh heard a groundswell of support from the people of Boston to give more support to artists and to the arts sector and to leverage the tools of city government to help creative expression uh, proliferate. So he's allocated a lot more money, it, money helps, because there wasn't much before, but we've also tried to make our approval processes disappear or be much, much easier. So I will say that what you're talking about is what we heard really loudly and we're responding to by creating a cultural plan, beefing up my office, funding it, and, and making grant opportunities available. Um, one of the things we did in our process was to empower local cultural leaders by um, having neighborhood-based uh, teams where engagement was done in every neighborhood to, to sort of really help people come together and help them articulate the vision for arts and culture in their neighborhood and to pull together that cohesion and that energy. And I, and I do think, I mean, I've only been here two and a half years, so I don't have the longitude and the benefit of a lot of years of experience. You guys probably can talk a lot more about how you've seen things change, but I will say that, that I, I think change is really in the air, um, and we have the money and the programs to, to sort of back up uh, the plans and to implement the plans. So I, I think your observations are a really good example of who holds the power, and how can you get, um, and who makes decisions, who decides, and who holds the power. And there's a new book by a guy named Eric Liu, who's at the Aspen Institute, which is a how-to book for citizens in today's world. And he talks about you don't have to be a majority. You can be a minority group and exercise real power that will make change by mobilizing people to get your wall done. And, and so I think one of the interesting things about his book is that we make an assumption that power rests in government or power rests in something, some other place. But actually, if you think about it, power rests in the people. So exercise, so I guess my interpretation of part of what's happening in our world is we abdicate power 
we need to take it back and exercise it loudly and fiercely and collectively. And so his book for me was sort of a, a symbol of when you ask who decides and you abdicate that decision, you give up power instead of exercising it. He makes the same argument, by the way, about not voting. He said, not voting is giving up power. Vote for whomever you want, but vote. Otherwise, you've abdicated. And so I think power, <laughs> our first founding document starts, we the people. Um, I, I've been there and I feel like, yeah, you, you gotta, you can't just ask permission. You gotta, you gotta take action. And I mean, you know, we got a wall once by uh, tagging it the night before and saying, hey, it seems you have a graffiti problem. Can we help you out with that? <laughs> um, now these are my young rambunctious days, but I, the statute I, of limitations has run out on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, it's, the, I feel like the idea though is that, you know, you have to, you know, you have to fight for it. And, and good art comes out of struggle. Uh, you know, the harder you fight for it, the better it'll be. And, um, and so don't stop fighting. We need art in our communities. Uh, if, if this guy doesn't want a mural on the side of a, of a building, paint one on the side of the building of his competitor. He will recognize his mistake. And, 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 and keep doing it. You know, when, when, we, when we started Artists for Humanity in, in the early 90s, uh, no one wanted to hear our voice. No one wanted to see our paintings. You know, I couldn't walk down the street if it wasn't a, a gang member or a police officer. Somebody was out to get me, you know. It was, it was just, I had to hide. And, um, but the art was there. It called to me, and the fact that when I was finally able to get my artwork on the wall, it was so much more of an accomplishment. And that's what made me addicted to that particular accomplishment and made me want to keep doing it and make sure our young people of Boston could do it more as well. Oh, and also, you know, give a guy 100 bucks, 200 bucks, he'll let you paint on his wall. <laughs> I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, so I'm a history teacher, and I'm going to be teaching a new course on citizenship at my school next year. Um, so it's a big reason why I was in, interested in coming today, just to hear about the idea of interdisciplinary approach to bringing in arts into a regular high school classroom. Um, and so I was wondering if you have any pointers or resources for educators who are not art teachers but want to bring this into our classroom so that we can provide students with that opportunity. So. Um, I'd give you a couple of resources. I'd, I'd go to the Amplify Foundation, um, which is the one that did a lot of the signs for the marches. They actually have an educator's um, sublink, and people are providing curriculum right there. Um, and so you can get it through them. And to the best of my knowledge, it's free. Um, another way to think about history and civic engagement is to think about organizations that actually do civic engagement projects that can be brought into a classroom. And um, one of those groups nationally is Campus Connect. Um, and they work on college campuses, but they often bring their work um, to other um, schools through their own students. So I talked to Campus Connect, um, which is a national organization based in Washington, D.C. And then later, if you want to come up, I can give you some others. I'd be delighted to. I would say that I, I think you can explore WGBH actually as well, which has a great educational wealth of material. I would add that you, you, I'm confident that you have resources in your school. That, that are going to help you think about this. If you don't have an art teacher, I agree that the art teacher shouldn't be in their silo. And if they are, they're ready to come out. At our, at our, at our school, we've, we've just gotten started, but already, the, especially that language arts and art teacher are working together. They did a great project with fences this year. They read fences and then made fences uh, that, were, that were displayed. Um, so if there's an art teacher, they're ready to come out and help you. And one of the things we're trying to do 
at our school, and this might be an opportunity for your students, is to frame almost any problem that you can come up with as a research task for your students. Mm -hmm. So think about the, the way that they could look at some aspect of art or lack thereof. I don't know if you're teaching in Boston, uh, a, a challenge with lack of public art in a certain community and then connect with Artists for Humanity and have them come talk about the work that they've done in the community and have that be part of the curriculum that the, that the students are, are learning to sort of help them think about how they might be able to transform the community that they're living in while learning history and connecting to the resources that are already there. Well, I think that concludes our program. It's great to be here, by the way, at this institute where I know the senator was a painter, but also, to your point, filled his office with art. We thank our panelists for being here tonight, and thank you for coming.